Ivan Ilyich's life has been the most simple and commonplace, and most horrifying. So begins the account of Ivan Ilyich's life in Chapter 2. Now, I do not want to take anything for granted here. What Tolstoy is saying, if I am not mistaken, is that the most simple and commonplace of lives, the unremarkable life of Ivan Ilyich, is the most horrifying. It is horrifying from the point of view of human happiness. The simple and commonplace life is what Ivan slid into without thinking over much. He took his cues from society, from proper social expectations. He was educated to a useful career. He demonstrated ambition to pursue a career well, moving up from a lowly attorney to becoming a member of the Court of Justice. He was married, he had children, and he raised them in the conventional way. He bought a house and was most concerned about how that house was laid out and decorated. He was sensitive to slights, in part because he was proud of his accomplishments. There was nothing exceptional about Ivan, except that he was unusually successful in the pursuit of his profession, and he had reached the upper part of the class to which he had belonged. It is important to be clear about this. There is nothing wrong or unusual about people being a slave to fashion, as we say today. Almost all human beings live in a cave of sorts and take their opinion about what is worthwhile from society, from our poets. Ivan is no exception to this rule. He is a normal, commonplace man. As a law student, Tolstoy writes, Ivan had become exactly what he was to remain the rest of his life, a capable, cheerful, good-natured, and sociable man, but one strict to carry out whatever he considered his duty, and he considered his duty all the things that were so designated by people in authority. Ivan took things on authority, just as his friends had, and presumably just as his wife had. He didn't give the nature of his life a second thought. It seems that he had sensed some of the things that he was doing were harmful to him. Again, page 44. As a student, he had done things which, at the time, seemed to him extremely vile and disgusting. But later, seeing that people of high standing had no qualms about doing these things, he was not quite able to consider them good, but managed to dismiss them and not feel the least perturbed when he recalled them. He would live his life entirely according to what was considered by current trends and fashions right and fitting. He bought new fashionable luggage on getting his first job. He horsed around a bit and always with class. He spoke to his lady friends in French. I am tempted to say that he was among the best and the brightest. Sure enough, when there was a need to found a new system of law courts after the liberalizing reforms of the 1860s, Ivan was at the forefront and was selected to help establish this new administration of justice. He was one of the first to give, quote, practical application to the judicial reforms instituted by the Code of 1864, end quote. He always conducted his official business with utter objectivity, by which I mean he had a public face and a private face. He could be warm and sociable in private, but in public, when carrying out his duties, he was exacting and dutiful. He loved the power of his position and used it responsibly, which made him love his position all the more. Seven years into his career, he marries. Not for love, though not exactly for money. She was a looker, but he could have done better. He married because his wife gave him pleasure and because it was the right thing to do. Pleasure and social acceptability matched. Since theirs was a marriage based on pleasure and propriety, it ran into trouble when it compromised their pleasure and propriety. 
It did so almost immediately. Quote, For no reason at all, his wife began to undermine the pleasure and propriety of their life. She became jealous without cause, demanded he be more attentive to her, found fault with everything, and created distasteful and ill-mannered scenes. Neither his wife nor Ivan thought about what they would have to give up in order to marry. Neither thought of how their old independence would no longer be. And hence, each felt aggrieved at the lack of unity in their marriage. What each was really complaining about was that the other failed to serve their independence. Remember how Ivan's illness was a great inconvenience to his wife, as we discussed in the opening chapter. This is not a marriage, but a mutual alliance, which will bring happiness only as long as their interests maintained such an alliance. When they are choosing curtains or furniture, their alliance is sound and respectable. At other times, at most other times, their alliance broke down. Ivan noted that marriage was not bringing him pleasure, so he decided to combat his wife and safeguard his independence by sinking his time into his important work. Quote, Ivan Ilyich increasingly made work the center gravity of his life. He grew more attached to his job and more ambitious than before, end quote. Ivan goes so far as to seek estrangement from his wife as a goal of marriage, for it freed him to conduct his career in the best way possible. There was a veneer of respectability which public opinion required, but it was matched with a reality of estrangement, which neither Ivan nor his wife would acknowledge nor do anything about. Ivan's marriage lasted 17 years in this way. Then, Ivan's world came crashing down. It happened in 1880, which Tolstoy calls the most difficult year of Ivan's life. Now think about this. Ivan, we learn from the first chapter, died in February 1882. His decline proceeds in 1881. 1880, that most difficult year, he is mostly is in, in perfectly good health. He is injured in a minor way, it seemed, only in the early winter of 1880. So it is not the death of Ivan Ilyich that makes 1880 such a problem. Nor can it be said that his marriage was unusually bad in 1880. Ivan had been living a lie for years, almost from the beginning of his marriage. Why was 1880 such a tough year? Tolstoy lists several reasons in his narration. Finances became tight and he could not make ends meet. He is passed over for a promotion at his job the source of his satisfaction and the focus of his life. People no longer recognized his greatness, it seemed. Ivan goes to the country to pass the summer more cheaply, but he is bored and suffers intolerable anguish. He decides to take decisive measures and to ask for a transfer and a large raise. He gets them. He appears to be on top of the world looking down on creation. Wife is happy. There seems to be a truce or mutual alliance as both husband and wife begin to prepare for a move to the country where they, he will take up a new post. Ivan's wife devoted herself exclusively to making plans for their life in the city to which they were moving. And Ivan Ilyich was delighted to see that her plans were his, that he and his wife were in agreement, and that after a little stumble, his life was resuming its genuine and natural quality of carefree pleasure and propriety. Husband and wife had a common project, a new house in a new locale. Ivan went ahead to establish himself in his job and began designing a new home. He is injured, to be sure, and this injury would, in due time, prove fatal. The old disputes arose between husbands and wife, 
the same diversion into work, and better still, the playing of whist, which made Ivan happy. New place, new job, same life. Chapter 3, the chapter cataloging this most difficult year in Ivan's life, ends with the following statement. Everything went along without change, and everything was fine. Everything was fine on the outside, according to what outside observers could see. However, the beginning of the discontent that would be brought to bear during Ivan's injury, the alienation from others, the anguish about whether he had made his life meaningful, the lack of genuine love and friendship, these factors begin to haunt Ivan in 1880, that most difficult of years. Perhaps we might see in this year, the year 1880, the return of the problems he noticed in his youth, where there were things that were vile, but he had stopped thinking about them because respectable people didn't think about them. Respectable people did not think about how empty their lives were or how pitiful their projects were. But Ivan had a clue into this even before he was knocking on death's door. And this made for a tough year. We will continue with Ivan's illness in the next video.